Okay, good morning. My name is Gloria and I'm from Mitchell Society Singapore. I'm the Vice Chair of the Education Committee. And uh, we um, today we are fortunate to have with us Natalie Kwa, who is a volunteer with the Herpetological Society of Singapore. She has a keen interest uh, in reptiles, amphibians and all things nature. So since her teens, she's now like in her 20s and studying environmental science at UCLA. So since her teens, she has been helping out in various conservation efforts within Singapore and hopes to spread an awareness of our rich biodiversity to everyone. So, um, and, uh, and of course, she also hopes to learn more about the magic behind all things green and blue. So, okay, without further ado, I have Natalie. Thanks, Natalie. Please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, where we'll be talking about the herb tiles of Singapore. So, if you've never heard of the word herb tiles and you're wondering what it is, you've come to the right place, because today we'll be talking all about it. <clears throat> so before we begin, a little introduction about me. Right? So my name is Natalie. I've been a volunteer at the Herpetological Society of Singapore for quite a few years now. I do a little bit of nature guiding and I help out with other events too. And I've been learning a lot from the other members, other volunteers in the society during my time. And so today I hope to be able to pass on some of this precious knowledge to everyone here. Okay, so time for herpetology. So herpetology, herb dolls, right? Like I've mentioned this a few times already. But what exactly is it? So herpetology is actually the study of reptiles and amphibians. So like your snakes, your turtles, your crocodiles and your lizards, um, and your frogs. Yeah. So why reptiles and amphibians, right? So actually reptiles and amphibians are not related to each other. So your frogs and your snakes, not really related. But um, they're studied together because they're often found at the same place. So they share the same habitat. Yeah. So fun fact that if you go looking for reptiles and amphibians, you can say you're helping. And now introduction to HSS. So Herpetological Society of Singapore. We are a volunteer group with many passionate individuals. Um, and we want to spread our love for herbs. So you see, this is an event at Festival of Biodiversity. Uh, I think maybe some of you have been before. So we go to events like this to give, um, to share our love. And we also give talks like the one I'm giving you right now. We also do nature walks. So obviously this was taken before COVID when we were able to hold big walks. So, but then the pandemic has made it quite difficult for us to hold such walks. So we've stopped them for now, but you can follow us to keep updated on when we do start giving walks again. So you can see this is me over here. Yeah. So it's actually on such a walk that I found myself very interested in herbs and decided to join HSS. Okay, so now we really begin, right? So how many species of snakes, lizards, and frogs do you think there are in Singapore? Just think of a number on your head, or if you want, you can shout it out. Okay, I'll give you five seconds to think, right? Um, over a thousand. Over a thousand. Okay. Okay, that is a bit, a bit, a lot. But different species wise, we have actually over a hundred and fifty different herbs. We definitely have more than a thousand individuals. But yeah, more than a hundred fifty different herbs in Singapore is actually a really incredible number for a small island like us. So since there are so many different species, right, I won't be able to cover all of them today, but I will briefly introduce you to some of the interesting ones. So we'll begin with amphibians. So amphibians, um, the most common group of amphibians we have is our frogs and our toads. So these are two very common species, the Asian toad and the four-line tree frog. You'll be able to find these maybe even outside your house. So the Asian toad can be found in like our gutters, the drains, the roadside, the curbs, um, almost anywhere. And this four-line tree frog can be found um, in more shrubby areas where there are... Um, sorry, Winnie, do you have a question? My school garden has a lot of other kinds of toads inside, but it's very difficult to catch one. Yeah, yeah. So these, yeah, exactly. You can find these in your gardens and... They're quite difficult to catch, yeah. But try not to catch them because you might scare them. Yeah. So the four-line tree frog is um 
is you might be able to see this in your garden because this is found in more shrubby areas where there's a bit more water and some more plants. So I think I know what some of you are thinking, right? So what is the difference between a toad and a frog? Is it if I kiss the frog, become a prince, and a cold toad don't become a prince? Hmm. Actually, the answer is that toads are frogs. So all toads are frogs. Toads are actually just a special type of frog. And what's special about them? So you look at, can you see my cursor here? So this over here is a special poison gland that frogs have. Oh, sorry, toads have. So toads will have this gland here, while the frogs don't have this gland. So this gland in toads will secrete poison. Um, and so all toads will um, have a poison gland uh, that all toads are poisonous with this poison gland. Whereas not all frogs are poisonous. Yeah. Okay, so now it's your turn, right? I'll give you some time to find where the poison gland is on this toad. Okay, I give you five seconds again. Okay, Have, did y'all manage to find that this is actually the poison gland here? This long line. It looks a bit different, right? Yeah, so um, this is a frog and this is a toad. This frog doesn't have the gland and this, frog, this toad has a gland here. So just now those um, species were um, urban dwellers. So you find them outside your house in your gardens. But these here are forest dwellers. So specifically, you can find them in um, secondary to young secondary to primary forest. Um, Angeline, you have a question. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, maybe you don't have a question. I but, think I found oh. the poison gland. Oh, you found the poison gland? It's over here, right? Do you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, this is the forage toad. Um, and what's special about the this species here, other than it being a forest species, is that it's the only species in Singapore that regularly calls in the day. So most toads, most other toads and frogs will call at night but this one likes to call in the day. And this other frog here is the cinnamon bush frog. So it's, I think it's my favorite frog species because it's very pretty. Look, it's a bright orange with white speckles over here. It's the only frog in Singapore with such um, beautiful bright coloration. And um, recently, NPARKS had a species recovery program to reintroduce this one into botanic gardens. So maybe if you go to botanic gardens, you'll be able to see the same cinnamon bush frog. Okay, so moving on to some other really special and really rare frogs that we have in Singapore. So these are also forest dwellers, but they're really rare. So if you see, this is the Malayan horned frog. It's critically endangered and only found in Bukit Timah, along with very restricted patches in the central catchment, which is MacRitchie area. So if you see um, this frog here, you see that one point, two point, and there's one more point here, which is the nose. So what are these points for? It makes the frog look really cool, right? It actually, actually, when you look at the frog from above, it looks like a leaf. See? You almost cannot see the frog, but if you were walking in a forest, you might just think that it's a leaf. So it's really good camouflage. And this picture here was actually taken in Borneo and not Singapore because um, it's just really difficult to spot and very rare in Singapore too. And then now we look at this Microletta species. So I admit it looks kind of boring beside this Malayan horn frog, but actually it's super interesting because it's actually an unknown species in Singapore. No one really knows what it is yet. It doesn't have like a species name. It's just the genus Microletta. So Singapore, even though we're very small, we're still discovering like new species now and then, which I think is really cool. So here's another amphibian that no one knows much about. Is it a worm? Is it a snake? No, it's neither. It's actually a Sicilian. So over here, you see the word Sicilian. 
So this Cecilian lives really deep underground, and even scientists have trouble finding them. So we don't know much about them. Um, we, in Singapore, we have two recorded species. Um, one was rediscovered here in 2015, and there's another species called the Singapore Black Sicilian, which is really mysterious because it was only seen once ever. So the Singapore Black Sicilian, we don't have a picture, but it was found in someone's garden, just like how you find your frogs in your garden, right? So someone just found it in their garden in the 1800s, you know, like more than 100 years ago. And he brought that specimen to the museum. And that one specimen is still in the British Museum. So um, it was transported to London. And we've never seen a second one again. So mysterious. Yeah. So now next, moving on to our crocodiles. So our crocs. In Singapore, we have one species, which I'm sure many of you have seen before in Sungai Bolo. Have you all seen it before? Raise your hand. Yes? Yeah, I see some of you raising your hand. Yeah, so this... Um, this crocodile is called the saltwater crocodile or the estuarine crocodile. So this is the biggest reptile in the world. And it's the same species that Indonesia has and Australia has. And this crocodile can grow up to seven meters long. So seven meters long is like so high, it's like two stories high. Yeah. And it also has the strongest bite force in the entire animal kingdom. So if it bites, it's really, really strong. Walk quickly. And the ones here in Singapore, though, is a lot smaller than 7 meters. You cannot find 7 meter crocs in Singapore. Why? Because in, Sing in overseas, right, they can eat things like sheep, goat, and bigger animals. But in Singapore, it only can eat fish and maybe an occasional bird. Yeah, so it's a lot smaller. Now for turtles. Turtles. So sea turtles in Singapore, we have two species that we can commonly see, the green turtle and the hawksbill turtle shown here. So these two are hawksbill turtles. This is the adult and this is the baby. So if you've been reading, reading the news, right, we've actually been seeing quite a lot of hawksbill turtles and their nests in our beaches, like East Coast Park and the Southern Islands. So interestingly, this hawksbill turtle is critically endangered, but it's the more common species in Singapore. So it's quite special. But the reason why we hardly see sea turtles in the first place, and the fact that, why, that it's very rare, is because of its high mortality rate. So out of every 1,000 eggs that the mother lays, only one makes it to adulthood. And this hawksbill turtle is even more um, endangered why? Because in spite of this one out of 1,000 chance of survival, um, people still poach them for their eggs and their shells. So people like to eat their eggs and people like to take their shells as um, art and jewellery, and which is not very nice. And they also get caught in fishing nets, such as this. So this was actually um, a picture taken from an article published this year in the Straits Times. So you can see a lot of uh, marine animals get caught in nets left up by irresponsible fishermen. And you can see over here is a hawksbill turtle that's caught in the net too. Yeah, so this is also a big problem we have in the sea. Go there, take off your head quick. Other than sea turtles, we also have freshwater turtles. So these turtles you can find in the forest. So these are our native turtles um, and not tortoises. Uh, Winnie, you have a question again? There's something in the hot park I saw before. It looks like a big nose turtle. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yes, we have those two. It's like a small pond, then everybody can like feed fish. Then we, sometimes there'll be this one big turtle which comes out of nowhere. That's very cool. If you go to our ponds, um, like in Windsor Park or at Hot Park, you'll be able to see some of our native turtles too. Yeah. So these two, you see, are turtles. They're not tortoises, right? So turtles can live inside or around water, but tortoises are completely terrestrial, which means that if you put them in water, they're likely to die and they can't survive. Yeah. So the differences um, other than the habitat is also their feet. So turtles have more flipper-like feet, but tortoises have like stumps for their feet. Mm. So, oh, Ellie, we have a question. 
Sorry, Ellie, you're unmuted. Found turtles at the park. Ooh. I think you, um, you also see a lot of the red ear sliders, the turtles with the red colored ears at the side. So those are very common too. Mm. Okay, so next we move on to lizards. So I'm sure many of you would have seen this at the parks. And every time I see one of these lizards, I confirm hear somebody say, Komodo dragon. But actually, no, no, no. These are not Komodo dragons, okay? So we don't have Komodo dragons in Singapore. These are water monitors. Uh, sorry, these are monitor lizards. We have the water monitor over here and we have the clouded monitor here. So um, they are related to the Komodo dragon, but Komodo dragons are only found on Komodo Island in Indonesia, not in Singapore. So the water monitors can grow up to three meters long, which is really long, and they can be found near the water. And what's the difference between the water monitor and the clouded monitor is that if you see their nostrils, so over here you see a nostril, and over here you see another nostril. So the water monitor's nostril is closer to the, to the edge of the snout, to the tip, and the clouded monitor's nostril is somewhere in the middle. So why? Because the water monitor lives in water, right? So when it wants to swim and it wants to breathe, it can just poke up its... Um, poke up its snout and breathe easily um, versus the clouded monitor, uh, which is smaller, so up to 1.5 meters, and um, doesn't live in the water, so more terrestrial areas. Actually, we have a really rare third species of monitor called the Dumeril's monitor, but it's only been seen four times in the last 30 years, so it's really rare. So um, these two, are uh, another two really common pair of lizards. So a lot of people think that the one on the right, this one here, is a chameleon. But actually, we don't have chameleons in Singapore. This changeable lizard is the one that you usually see on fences, in your gardens also, or along um, roadsides. And this green crested lizard is more commonly found in your parks and forests. So this changeable lizard is actually an introduced species, so not native to Singapore. When it came to Singapore, um, it increased the competition for the green crested lizard. And so now this green crested lizard is actually less commonly sighted because it's more difficult to find food because the changeable lizard is eating all its food, right? Okay, and then now for an exciting fact. Did you know lizards can fly? So this is a Sumatran flying dragon, which is part of the Draco genus. So I see Draco here. In Singapore, we have three different types of dracos. So firstly, you see this flap over here, right? So it has a flap at the neck. So this flap is a dewlap. It actually uses it to communicate with other lizards. And so this is a male lizard with a very big flap. Female lizards have a much smaller uh, dewlap. And how does this fly? So if you look at this picture here, you look, it has like wings, but they're not actually wings. Is actually their rib cage. So if you feel your rib cage, right, it's hard and it's stuck to your body. But the Draco lizard's rib cage can open. So its rib cages will open and form this thing called a patagium, and that which allows it to glide from tree to tree. So it'll jump off, and this um, patagium will help it glide. Um, and this other gecko here. So we have another kind of uh, lizard that can fly. So it's very cool. You know why? Because its name is the Cool Gliding Gecko. Yeah, it's a very cool looking gecko. But instead of uh, ribs that can expand, it has webbed feet. So you see its feet here. It's webbed. So these webbed feet help it glide from tree to tree. Actually, in Singapore and other parts of Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, Malaysia, um, a lot of animals can glide, like lizards um, and squirrels. They can glide. And it's interesting because um, it's quite unique to our forest. And why do we have this adaptation? It's because it's just a lot safer to glide from tree to tree, then go down where all the predators lie, and then go up the other tree, right? So they just jump. So um, the last two lizards for today is the common sun skink and the tamasic swamp skink. So um, the common sun skink is very common 
found in our forests, um, sometimes even our parks, sometimes. Um, and this thermastic swamp skink is found in our swamps and mangroves. So now on to my favourite part, and the part that I'm sure all of us have been waiting for, which is snakes. So we have quite a diversity of snakes in Singapore, of all different sizes. Um, and this is a really, really small snake here that we have. So this is a Brahmini blind snake. And when you look at it, sometimes you even think it's an earthworm because it's that small. And the Brahmini blind snake is actually the most distributed snake in the world. So it's found on every single continent except Antarctica. So if you look closely, this Brahmini blind snake has scales. You see the little scales? And it also has tiny eyes over here. Um, I've seen one of those before. I, at first, I didn't know what else it was. Oh, yeah. Actually, they're so... They're very common, but somehow I've never seen them before. So you're really lucky and have really good eyes. Yeah, so trust me, right? It's a snake because of its scales. And another fun fact is that this species is an all-female species. It does not need males to reproduce. Um, yeah, so its babies are, are almost like clones to its mummies. And this is another small snake here called the gimlet's reed snake. So it's a bit longer than an earthworm. So it's not really, it's bigger than the Brahmini blind snake. Um, but what's special about this snake is that it was rediscovered in Singapore in 2017 by our very own HSS member, Ing Sin. So before he saw it in 2017, it was actually not seen for 84 years. So, so cool. We are, we are finding, um, old, we are rediscovering old species uh, every day. So these two species, um, of snakes, I think are also very pretty because of its iridescent scales. So you look at the rainbow in the scales of these two species. Yeah. So this is the sunbeam snake. The sunbeam snake is kind of ironic because it's actually nocturnal and only found at night. So maybe we should change its name to moonbeam, right? Not sunbeam. Um, and this over here is the reticulated python. So this is the largest snake in the boat. It's the longest. It can grow up to 10 meters long. So 10 meters is so long. Um, and it doesn't grow up to that size in Singapore because just like the crocodile, it doesn't get to eat big animals. Um, it can only eat smaller things like rats. Um, so it does help with uh, rat population control. And it also eats, sometimes it eats things like cats and maybe the occasional pangolin. And now for my favorite snake. So this is the paradise tree snake. So um, look at the colors, it's really pretty, right? So what's special about this snake is just like the Draco, it can fly or glide. Um, but I like to say it can fly because it's cooler. Yeah. So if you look at this zoomed in photo here, um, you can see that this snake is kind of flat. It can flatten itself. So when it wants to glide from tree to tree, it will flatten its body into like a really long frisbee. So your frisbee is round, right? But this is like really long. Yeah. So it glides from tree to tree and in the air as it jumps. So when it jumps from tree to tree, it will go something like this, like slither in the air and it can allow it to glide to the other tree. Yeah. So this one over here just landed. So that's why it's still flat. If not, it will be round like normal snakes. Okay, so... In Singapore, we have venomous snakes too. Uh, specifically, we have seven highly venomous snakes. So just now I said that the toads have poison and then these snakes have venom. So poison and venom, what's the difference? So just remember, oh, Winnie, do you know the answer? Uh, is it venom must be injected into your skin, injected somewhere or at least entered by... Yeah, either by a bite or sting. Mm, yes, so ve very, very smart. So venom has to be, um, if you remember, if it bites you, if the animal bites you and you get, um, you, you might not die but you, and, you, and it affects you, it's venom. But if you bite it, so if you eat it or you lick it and it affects you, that's poison. Yeah, venom must be injected and poison must be ingested. Okay, so we have seven highly venomous uh, snakes in Singapore. Um, I'll go through each of them. 
So firstly, we have the Malayan blue coral snake. So over here. This is the first thing I saw in Singapore, actually. And it's really beautiful. And it has the longest venom glands in all snakes. So um, the Malayan blue coral snake can grow up to 1.5 meters and can be found in our forest. And the Malayan banded coral snake can grow, it's a bit smaller. Um, it can grow up to 60 cm. Um, but both these coral snakes eat other snakes. So its diet is snakes. Um, and if you see over here, what the Malayan banded coral snake is doing is that it's showing its threat display. So when it feels scared or threatened, right, it will flip its um, underside and show people the show its threat, the markings to scare its threat away. So next we have the banded crate. So this um, it also eats other snakes and it can be found in our mangroves and coastal areas, especially in Pulau Ubin. And here we have the equatorial spitting cobra, which is a really cool snake because it spits venom. Um, this is the only species in Singapore that can spit venom. And over here is a juvenile because you see it has white spots on its, under its hood. Um, adults would be totally black. Mm. So the next picture that I'm going to show you, do not ever, ever, ever do it, okay? Um, even if the snake is dead, don't do this because it can still envenomate you. So this is a dead specimen and this was done in a lab. So what I want to show you here, right, is actually this hole. So you see this hole? So you know injection needles have a hole, right? So snake fangs are just like injection needles. But usually, um, the hole for the snake fangs is at the back of the tooth, of the fang, sorry. So it'll be behind. Um, but this is a spitting cobra. And it's special because its hole is in front. So it's in the front, that's why you can see it. So when it opens it, its mouth and it wants to spit its venom, um, it will come out of this hole. And the spitting cobra only spits venom on its threat and it doesn't use it to hunt prey. So only to scare things away. Mm. So uh, next we have the king cobra. So the king cobra in Singapore, it's actually the longest venomous snake in the world. And it has a record of over five meters. Um, as you can see, the king cobra also eats other snakes. So over here, it's actually eating a python. And this picture was taken in Sungai Bulo. And guess what? Did you know that king cobras are not actually cobras? So they're fake cobras, right? The cobras is, is the, um, just now what we saw, the spitting cobra. That's a cobra. Um, it's called a king cobra only because it has something that looks like a hood. And so um, people just call it a cobra. So another fun fact is that usually when you see the word uh, king uh, in its name, um, it means that it eats other snakes. And lastly, we have the pit vipers. So if you look over here, um, if you look at this over here, this is not actually the nostril, but it's a heat sensing pit. That's why it's called a pit viper, because it has a pit. So this pit senses heat and it helps it um, uh, sense its environment and watch out for its prey and potential threats. So the ones that we have in Singapore, the Waggles Pit Viper and the Shaw Pit Viper, um, are actually ambush predators. So what this means is that it will lie in wait and it won't move until its prey comes to it, rather than going to actively hunt for the prey. Um, this Waggles Pit Viper, as you can see, it's very interesting, right? The female and the male looks very different. The female is also a lot bigger than the male. So this species can be found in our forests, while the shore pit viper, which is also called the mangrove pit viper, can be found in our mangroves. Okay, so now we know all of this. I'm sure some of you are wondering, what do I do when I see a snake, a venomous snake, right? What should I do? Should I run away? Uh, should I be scared? Well, not really. No, you don't have to be. So yes, these are some golden rules. Um, firstly, these snakes are very cute, right? You see this face, it's so cute. Um, the snakes don't actually mean you harm unless they think that you are trying to attack it. So don't panic because if you panic, the snake might think that you are being aggressive. Um, they are usually more afraid of you than you are of it. Um, so once you see the snake, you can observe the snake or herb or any animal um, in that matter from a safe distance. And if you think that the animal or you are in danger, you can contact acres or end parks. Um, 
So you can take a picture of these numbers here. So in case you see something that needs help, you can call the hotlines. These organizations are very well trained to handle wildlife, uh, just like snakes. So as to effectively and safely prevent harm from both you and the animal. Yeah. So sometimes people will think to call pest control, but actually these um, hotlines are recommended over pest control because um, these organizations are trained to uh, handle wildlife. Yeah. And it's better to call someone who's trained in, uh, in wildlife um, to handle wildlife. So remember that coexistence is a choice, right? So if you like these uh, cute little herbs to stay in our ecosystem and keep them healthy, do respect our animals and their personal space, and I'm sure they will respect you as well. Finally, here are some ways to keep in touch with HSS. If ever you want to go for our walks or ask any questions, you can contact us here. Thank you. Okay, thanks Natalie for the interesting talk. Okay, so um, if anybody have any questions, please type it into the chat group. Or since uh, we are so um, interactive this morning, we can even uh, unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Anybody? Okay, someone want to ask uh, the difference between uh, venomous and poisonous again. Can you explain it again? Hmm. So, um... uh, who want to walk this? Sorry, Gloria, do I? Answer? Okay, no, no, Natalie, uh, go ahead and answer the question. Uh, yes. Okay, so poison and venom. Um, an easy way to remember is that if you, if you bite it, um, and you get that you get poison. But if it bites you, you get envenomated, right? So poison needs to be ingested, and then um, venom needs to be injected. Is that clear? Uh, yeah. I'll just type it out so that we can remember it. Okay, so what are your best tips to spot Python? Python, ah. hmm. So Pythons, I think, um, have been... Recently, if you read the news, you can kind of see them in urban places as well. So sometimes what I like to do is that when you walk, when you take a walk along Longkang or like the canal, you look inside and maybe there might be a Python inside. But if not, you really just have to um, open your eyes, you know, like sometimes, um, sometimes they are at places when you take a walk in the forest, sometimes it's quite difficult to spot because they are hidden underneath um, underneath bushes and trees. But generally, pythons are not really found like high up on trees. Uh. They're like usually in your, in your line of sight and below. So you can just take a look in your drains and whatnot. Maybe you'll be able to find a python. Yeah. Okay. Ali, you want to ask a question? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Ali, you want to ask a question? You can unmute yourself. Uh, okay, please unmute yourself. Skin of cobra. I'll say that again. What, what about the skin of cobra? I'm scared of cobra. Oh, you're scared of cobras. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to be scared because it, it means that you will stay away and not get hurt. Okay, because you are not trained to handle snakes, so it's better to uh, fear them and instead uh, don't go too near. But of course, we don't want to kill them okay, because they belong to as part of an ecosystem. I'll say that the cobras are also very scared of you, Ellie. So if you ever see a cobra, right, you can just watch it from a distance. Um, don't go near it because you don't want to scare it also. Yeah, because the cobra is also very scared of you. So you can just watch it and admire it because they're actually really pretty. Mm. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, when, when you see people picking up snakes by the tail, why do they not roll up and bite, bite you? Mm. I would say firstly, don't pick up snakes by their tails because they might do that. They can yeah, roll up and bite you. Have, yes, they actually can have quite um, strong stomach muscles yeah. and able to like, do a really good sit up and, and bite you. Yes. Yeah, so I would say it's not that they don't, because they do, yeah. Um, for those that don't, I, I'm not sure. Maybe they don't feel threatened enough. But if they do feel threatened, they definitely will try to defend itself. Yeah. Okay. And how common are soft shell turtles in Singapore? Mm, how common? I'm not very sure how common. 
I do know that when we go to parks, we don't usually see them because we usually see the red ear sliders. So the, the turtles with the red uh, marking on its ear. So we usually see those because actually those are not, uh, they're not native to Singapore. They are introduced, right? So a lot of people buy them as pets. And then like you buy the turtle and then you think you cannot take care of the turtle anymore. So you release the turtle into our waters. And therefore they just, um, um, they multiply and they populate um, our, our ecosystem. So that's how you see those a lot more than our native turtles. Yeah. So next time if you see someone with a pet who wants to release a pet, please advise them against it. Um, if we do want to see more of our native turtles around. Okay, maybe I can add, add to that. Uh, basically, the Asiatic soft shell turtle can be seen in Hinhit Park in the day, uh, but mostly they are uh, nocturnal and they come out at night. Um, but actually, sometimes the soft shell turtle, there's also a Chinese soft shell turtle which is introduced. Yeah, and uh, it's, that's because uh, people eat it for turtle soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, some people buy and release it as part of the merit. But again, like what Natalie said, we shouldn't release any non-native or even shouldn't even release any animals to the wild. Yeah, be it uh, turtles, birds, or anything else. Okay. And there's also um it's, there's also a huge forest, uh Sosha turtle, the big forest one. I forgot what is the name. Natalie, do you know? I'm not very sure so, but I know I've seen yeah. soft shell turtles in Windsor Park also. Like 70 but... cm big, yes. Wow, okay. No, in I've the, not seen that one. In the, in the CNR, yeah, the Central Nature Reserve. So I've seen all this before. Okay, so the next question. Um, okay, for the Wagner Spit Viper, how do you differentiate a male or female? Mm, okay, let me go back to my slide. Maybe you can see it clearer there. Yeah. Okay, do you see this? So this is the male. And this is the female. So they look really, really different, right? The male is green with red and white spots. And the female is just really colorful. It's black and yellow and white. Um, yeah, yellow stripes, black body. Um, the female is actually a lot larger. Um, I'm not sure the exact dimensions, but if you, you will see it's a lot um, thicker. And yeah, whereas the male is really, really small. So it looks like a baby waggles pit. Baby waggles pit actually all look like males. And when it wants to become a female, not when it wants to, when it's going to become, when it's growing older, it will turn, the females will, will turn into this color. Okay. Okay, so people, uh, the kids here seem to want to find venomous snake. So where is the best place to find them? Like, where is the best place maybe to the find? spitting cobra or whatever. Oh... Uh, I've seen the waggers pit the most um most often amongst all the venomous snakes. Uh, you can find them in your central catchment. So MacRitchie, um, you can you will be able to find them. These are not too rare. Uh, shaw pit viper is also quite common if you go to our mangroves. So like Passeris mangroves, uh, Sungai Bulu, you'll be able to see the pit vipers. King cobras, if you want to see, I know Sungai Bulu um uh, will have um have a few but also quite difficult to spot you have to be there right place right time and a lot of it is luck also mm. what sorry some people okay the uh just to add the black spitting cobra actually is quite common it can be found in parks uh, gardens and a lot of uh, disturbed abandoned land uh as in state land so um if you're lucky you can see it is black and it's quite big but just keep your distance because it, when you speak, mm. it's actually aiming for your eyes, okay? To, uh, to in mm. that sense, to, um, to dis distract you so that you can get make a getaway. Yeah, don't scare it. That's the most important. Yes. Okay. So How do snakes mate? How do snakes mate? How do snakes mate? Uh? Um, so, I think different snakes probably have different, uh, different ways of mating. But I know that we have some snakes in Singapore where um, the female will release, um, oh, I can't remember that word now. Um, will release like a scent to attract the males and then the males will all come to mate with the female. Pheromone? Yes, yes, that's a word. Correct. Yeah, because some of the snakes, uh, they, they actually form a, the, the, basically the female snake, like what 
uh, uh, the pheromones will release and then the male snakes will come. So sometimes more than one turn up mm. and uh, they uh, they have to tussle and sometimes they form a snake ball. So it's like several snakes together. Yeah, so if you were fortunate enough to see it before. Yeah. yeah. several you, snakes congregating, yes. If you watch The Wild City, um, I think episode three or four, they have yes. one scene where they show the snakes meeting and it's very cool. The bronze bag. Yes, Wild City, uh, Channel News Asia. You can uh, mm. go on YouTube to look for it. Okay. So, um, okay, Ali, you want to ask a question? When? I think Fatin or Ahmad wants to ask a question. Okay, Ali, how, please, Ali. How did coral snakes get their name? Ooh. I'm not very sure how they got the names, but as you can see, coral snakes are very pretty and brightly colored. So I suspect it's probably because of that, maybe. Um, I can only guess. Yeah. Okay, uh, Winnie and Ali, uh, whoever, any of you can ask a question first. Okay, Ali, Ali, am I? Just uh, since I saw Ellie's hand come up first, Ellie. My friend, he he's not scared of snakes because he will be very quiet. The snake will go around his neck. Okay, if you see a wild snake in Singapore, do not let the snake go around your neck. Okay, yeah. So um, maybe yeah. those are pet snakes. But in Singapore, we're not allowed to keep pet snakes. Yeah. So if we don't know what the snake is, and um, it's best just not to keep your distance and respect the snakes also. Yeah. So even if you're not scared, don't approach the snake. Okay, Winnie, you want to ask your question? I think they're called coral snakes because the first few were found in the water, like camouflaging with the corals. Oh, is that right? I think something like that because I read one of my books. It was something about that. Oh, maybe, maybe then. But the coral snakes in Singapore are usually found in our forest and like not near the the ocean where the corals are. So, but maybe they are related. Okay, so uh, Daniel wants to know whether just now what you presented the snakes, turtles, and other herbs uh, are they seen uh in our secondary forest or? Or where do where can you find them? Most of um most of them are found in our secondary um forests. So like our nature reserves, um, you'll be able to see quite a lot of them. Some of them are urban dwellers, just like um what Gloria mentioned about the black spitting cobra. Sometimes you can find in more disturbed areas, and like the Asian toad and the frolling tree frog. Those are urban species as well. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe you want to cover about iguanas because some people uh, have oh. mistake that uh, the iguanas in Singapore. Uh, there are a couple, there are some iguanas restricted to some areas in Singapore, but those are not actually wild. Um, they're not actually native. They're again uh, released pets. So just like how sometimes you see a pet bird who accidentally flew away, it would be the same for the iguanas. They're not really part of like our natural ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. So uh, can a snake envenomate itself? That means, it, let's say it bites its own tongue? Interesting question, which I'm sorry I don't have the answer to. <laughs> I'm not very sure about that. It's, it's okay. We can all Google the answer, okay? Ourselves. Okay. Um, wait, uh, let me see what the questions. You have like 20 questions or maybe comments. Let's see. Oh, I think it's the same. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe I, I ask a question. Uh, how many snakes have you seen yourself in Singapore? You have I a used to, hmm. I used to keep a count a long time ago, but okay. I stopped keeping track. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't have a number. I'm sorry. Okay, I haven't okay. seen that many to, for, for sure because my eyes are actually not really good at spotting. So yeah, I always need to go with my friends who can spot yeah. the snakes. Okay, uh, we don't have much time, so Ali, uh, you can ask a question, Ali. I we haven't see. seen any snakes. You haven't seen any snakes? Oh, okay, they are quite... I'm sure you will one day. Yeah, especially the oriental whip snake, the, hmm. the neon green one. Yeah. 
Emily, okay, is... Emily has a related question on how to spot snakes. Yeah. So, Gloria, oh. do you have any like, how do you spot snakes? Oh, uh, you basically um, do pattern recognition. That means you looking. You're basically looking for something long or coiled up. So for me, because I'm a nature guide, I look for um, something that basically I look for the pattern of how snakes are like. So. Uh, spread along a branch. So every single thing that's long, I will look closely to see if mm-hmm. it's thick or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially vines. So if you walk and then you see like tree vines and stuff, sometimes you really need to look closely because they might not they might not be a vine. But sometimes also um snakes like will call itself up. Like the wagon split viper likes to likes to kind of bump, bundle up in a ball sometimes. So you see that shape that doesn't really look like part of the plant. Mm, just look closely, it might be a snake. Okay, I think uh, Fatin and or Ahmad wants to ask a question. Ahmad? Um, last time in Botanical Gardens just now, my father spotted a wood snake, something like that, but I didn't see. Okay, yeah, the whip snake is, uh, yeah, you're right, can be found in Botanical Gardens in quite a lot of places. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Winnie wants to ask, where can we find many snakes? I think we've had quite a lot, of, uh, quite a lot of luck at Basiris mangroves. So if you go to Basiris mangroves, um, you'll be able to see a lot of whip snakes, oriental whip snakes. And also, if you look into the, um, into the mangroves like the roots, um, sometimes you find like mangrove snakes, like your dog face water snake. Um, and if you look at a bit higher above the water, sometimes you see your shore pit viper also. So over there is quite a good spot because you can find your mango snakes as well as your um, park snakes, like your whip snakes. Okay, so I just I want to add, basically, uh, Passeries Park, uh, actually to see dog face water snake, you need to go at night because they're nocturnal snakes. So yes, that's when yes. they come out to hunt and um, for fishes and all that. Yeah, Yeah, you can go in the evening, like sunset time. Yeah, oh. evening or night, basically you need to have a torchlight to, to see them. Yeah, so there are actually night walks uh, to some of these places. Yeah. Okay, I think um, that's all the questions for now. Anybody else wants to ask a question? Uh, just give me one minute to type. Okay, yeah. okay, there are two new messages now. Oh, okay. How did snakes end up uh, going to people's toilet bowls? And uh, how to ward off these snakes? Mm. Okay, so for the first part, how they end up in people's toilet bowls, I think maybe you're talking about the reticulated python where there was a news article a while back about someone finding in a toilet bowl. Um, because these pythons um, can, can enter like the canals, right? And then so they can enter the sewage system. And I think in that, in that one case, it did end up in someone's toilet bowl. Yeah. But I don't think it's very common. Um, yeah, so how to ward off those snakes? A bit difficult to say. Uh, because we can't really, you know, it's block our I did sewage. Look before you sit. Because yeah, especially I... in nature areas, um, that, that actually it happened quite a few times. Um, like even in Raffles Country Club and all that, uh, essentially look before you sit down. Yeah, because um, you never know. But yeah. it's okay, don't worry. They, it doesn't happen often like what Natalie said. Yeah. Okay, so, um, oh yeah. Somebody's asking about nukes and salamanders. Uh, they're, they're not found in Singapore. Unfortunately. I yeah. like them. <laughs> yeah, they're really cute. The common youth. Okay. Um, any last questions? No? Okay. Oh, Ellie, you want to say something? How do the snakes end up in the toilet bowl? Uh, they, they can come up the sewage pipes and then uh, they can... Uh, actually, only the python, uh, because it's big enough, um, it doesn't drown. So it, can, it could do that, but it's not common. Don't worry. Yeah, and the pythons are in the sewage because they're after rats. They want to eat a, a rat for their dinner. So um, that's why they're found there. Yeah. Okay. The pythons also use our canals as their own highway to get between places. So that's why, like what Natalie said, you can find them in canals and drains. Uh, yeah, I've also seen it in a pipe. Okay. Okay, maybe one last question. What happens if you step, step on a snake? The snake will get scared. Um, it, like, what happens if someone steps on you on accident, right? You will feel pain. And then you would, um, if it's a huge giant stepping on you, you get very scared. 
Um, so I think that that would be similar to what a snake would feel, and the snake might try to, um, <coughs> might try to retaliate. You know, so just watch where you step and don't step on snakes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Natalie, for giving a very good talk and uh, for everybody participating. Okay. So we'll see you again in the next talk. Uh, we'll be having a fun with Singapore insects. Okay. So you all can sign up um, in the Nature Society website or other places. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B